five years ago, I found myself flying in a seaplane off the coast of British Columbia. The plane circled and touched down near a cove lined with trees and thick brush as far as the eye could see. I hopped from one of the plane's floats to a piece of driftwood, then onto the saturated moss at the water's edge. It started raining. I remembered thinking, hmm, maybe I haven't quite thought this through. <laughs> I was competing in a brand new History Channel reality show called Alone, one that was, as I was about to find out, really, really real. <laughs> I had a small handful of survival items and a huge case of camera equipment. My job was to survive in the wild for as long as I could and film the entire experience. There would be no camera crew, no outside assistance, just me. I was competing against nine other individuals, and the person who stayed out in the wild the longest would win half a million dollars. <laughs> After seven weeks of chilly nights and a whole lot of rain, I tapped out, only to find that there was only one other participant remaining. However, the only thing second place got me was cold hands, wet feet, and a rash roughly the shape of Ohio. <laughs> to my surprise, I was asked back onto the show two years later for a redemption season <laughs> that I was told would take place somewhere in Asia. Thought I'd get a tan, maybe. Uh, a few weeks later, I was dropped into the uh, wilderness of northeastern Mongolia, a few miles south of the Siberian border. <laughs> For the record, Asia, really big. Big <laughs> continent. Yes. 60 days after being dropped at my location, the producers showed up and my wife was with them. She told me I was the last one. I was the winner. Then, I cried on national television. <laughs> After a few minutes, a helicopter came, picked us up, and we left the wilderness. This is the final shot of the show. I'm often asked what I was thinking in this very moment up here as I stared out of that chopper. Was I marveling at the beauty of nature? Was I looking for the nearest burger joint? <laughs> yes, to both of those things. However, there was something far more introspective going on. For the past eight or so years, I have taken part in what I like to call wilderness journeys, where I go out into the wilderness for weeks at a time, and I'm hiking, paddling, and living from the land's resources. I love the feeling of being completely surrounded by wilderness. Now, every time I finish one of these journeys, I like to take a moment, stop, think about everything that the journey has taught me. I can honestly say that I have never stepped foot into the natural world without learning something. But this time, the learning was far more personal. If you take just these two TV experiences alone, I spent well over 100 days alone in the wilderness. I lived off of everything from salmon and wild onions to leeches and mice. For the record, mice. Good. Leeches, bad. <laughs> I was often cold, sometimes wet. I had to try extremely hard every day just to cut enough firewood to stay warm during the nighttime. In fact, the lifestyle was so difficult that after it was all over, I ended up looking like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I've been teaching wilderness living skills from fire starting to canoeing for my entire adult life. And I can tell you, it was not on the list of careers that my high school counselor showed me. <laughs> but I'm happy that it's the one I pursued. Even though I've always taught the skills of how to survive in the wilderness, I now see a deeper connection and a reason for why we as human beings need the natural world in our lives. For starters, the wilderness helps us to slow down and be thankful. When I am in the wilderness, the first thing I do every day 
is get up and start a fire that I will use to boil my water, cook my food, and of course stay warm. I nurse a delicate spark into a stable fire, and within a few minutes of waking up, I've accomplished something special. However, in civilization, if we need a tool, we go to the store and buy it. If we need water, we turn on a faucet. If we need food, we go to a room full of food and pick out the few things that we need. Or better yet, and this is my favorite, we get it handed to us through a window <laughs> as we sit comfortably in our climate-controlled vehicles complaining about the weather. <laughs> we have become obsessed with speed and convenience. When I'm in the wilderness, my favorite thing to do is be still and observe. After all, the birds, the clouds, everything in nature tells a story. When I hear the birds singing throughout the forest, I know that the forest is at peace. It's very unlikely that there would be any predators there. When I look at the smoke from a campfire and I see it going low to the ground as opposed to going straight up, I can tell that the barometric pressure may have dropped, meaning that bad weather could be on its way. There's this thing in the world of wilderness education called a sit spot. It's where you go out alone in the woods and you sit down in nature and take in the world around you. It helps you feel more comfortable out in the woods, but it also gives you a chance to think of everything you have to be thankful for. I'm often asked, after explaining what a sit spot is, eh, don't you think that's kind of a waste of time? But being thankful is never a waste of time. Another thing that the wilderness does for us when we take on the challenge of being in it is it helps us to become courageous. You see, one day while I was in Mongolia, I tried to reinvent the lost art of spoon carving. That was stupid. <laughs> uh, it was all going well until my knife slipped. I felt the knife go into my hand, bounce off a bone in my finger before exiting. Looking down at my hand, I knew exactly what I looked like on the inside. As I stared at my hand, finger hanging limp, I thought, well, I've got two options now. The first is to call for a medical evacuation. They'd come get me with a helicopter, maybe. <laughs> but I thought, no, that's silly. It's only a flesh wound, right? The other option was to fix it myself. I took a couple of deep breaths, whew, flushed the wound out with boiled water, closed the wound, and applied a medicine plant called yarrow to help the wound heal faster. Now, I want you guys to get this. Life in the woods is extremely rough sometimes, but the day that I sliced my hand open and spewed blood all over the place was significantly better than the best day I ever spent working in a cubicle. <laughs> we thrive when we are pushed to live outside of our comfort zones. The wilderness makes us courageous because it allows us to face a new challenge and a new adventure every single day. The last thing I want to share with you all today is the sense of independence that being in nature can provide us as people. But this independence, which is otherwise a, a gateway to discovery, has one very damaging enemy. I call it hands-off policy, and its effects are devastating. Let's imagine you're six years old. You've gone with your school on a field trip to a local forest, but you'd rather be playing video games. As you start down the trail, you look down, you notice a leaf. The color, the texture, the shape, it all draws you in. You reach down, you pick it up, and you feel the squish of the mud between your fingers, and it feels good. Just as you're learning more about this amazing little piece of nature, you hear the stern voice of an adult saying, leave it there, stay in line. You continue down the trail, 
but your sense of curiosity and discovery was not engaged or encouraged. If we want to live in a world where people care about the environment, we need to introduce everyone to the natural world through a hands-on experience. Laptops, desks, and classrooms don't work for that. We need nature in our lives, and science agrees. Over the last few decades of studying this, we've found that people who spend more time in nature are healthier, both mentally and physically. They have better mental clarity, they're happier, they can even heal from injuries faster. One such study even showed that patients who were placed near a window outlooking nature healed faster from their surgeries. If looking through a window can help you heal better, think of what spending a day in the woods can do for you. How about a week, a month, a lifetime? So how do we shake this hands-off policy and become more independent through nature? The solution is very simple. Go play in the woods. <laughs> Climb up a hill. Walk through a forest or a prairie. Get in a canoe and paddle yourself across a river. Take your kids outside to collect mulberries and build a fort out of dead branches. Those are the memories from my childhood that I'll never forget. Because those are the moments when I first remember feeling truly alive. I fell in love with the natural world at first sight. Being in nature was the first time that I ever felt like my life was worth more than what I could accomplish while sitting in a desk in a windowless room filling out a Scantron. So after 100 plus days out in the woods, starving half to death, twice, on two different continents, filming a reality TV show, of all things, I finally made this connection between us people and the wilderness. But the wilderness cannot be explained. It can only be experienced. Henry David Thoreau once said, everyone must believe in something. I believe I'll go canoeing. <laughs> I would encourage all of you to do the same. Thank you. <laughs>